Lori Houston's News for the Heart is dedicated to helping you give a voice to your own soul. Our hearts have the power to free us from pain and the struggles that keep us from awakening to our true essence. Join Lori now as we delve into our heart and soul to find the path that will open us to the possibilities and lead us to the life we love to live. And good afternoon. This is News for the Heart. And today, well, it's almost New Year's Eve and I have Tom Campbell with me. So we'll do our New Year's Eve show. Um, I thought this time, instead of looking at some of the resolutions that people choose, I thought we'd pick up on, you know, some of the big tips. I think one of the best tips would probably be getting Tom's Park. <laughs> His, uh, <laughs> it's, it's come out now in audio. It's 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 in paperback, too. Is that mm-hmm. it's, it is it's all out now? Paperback, hardback, audio oh, and hardback. ebook. Nice. Yeah. Nice. And the hardbacks in color. Oh, lovely. Yeah, well, of course, the ebook's in color too. <laughs> it, well, unless you have a Kindle and then when you download it, it's black and white. But yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Unless okay. you do it on your phone or on, your, on some other, um, yeah, some other app, you can definitely get both. Mm-hmm. All right. So it's out. That would probably be a great place to start because then you could use your imagination and you could you know, start imagining all the different things that you want to happen or how getting the support within Tom's Park to even, you know, look at what the different things that you're wanting to do. But, and I hope that people have gotten it. I think it's, I think it's brilliant. So I haven't quite got it yet, but it's coming. (laughs) (laughs) It's definitely coming this year. You know, what it does is basically gives people a very, a protected and safe environment in which they can do the kind of things they need to do to grow. Right. But it's hard to do that here when you have, you know, demands and responsibilities and, you know, this, this world is kind of unforgiving uh, in, in many ways, you know, and it's, there's all the water under the bridge here as well, you know, but so you go to Tom's park and it's, it's like you're in a new, a new realm and you can interact in that realm however it is you'd like to be you can try out new things and be be you know it's perfectly safe you're not going to mess up your life you know by trying out new things new ways of being so yeah. that's part of what it does but anyway let's get on to new year you know we're close to close to new year's this is uh what the 28th so we have just a few more days before we turn over the new year and a lot of people, when they get to the new year, start thinking about how is the next year going to be different and how can I do better next year? So it's just not repeating the same old stuff that really didn't work before, you know, and it's really not going to work again. <laughs> that's uh, that's the way it is. If you don't change something, then you shouldn't expect the results to be any different. Yes. And I think the point that needs to be made is that the changing things can't be from the intellect. This can't be a, oh, I'm going to do this differently because you think you should. Mm -hmm. That won't work because if you do things because you think you should, that'll last for about two weeks and then it'll just disappear and you'll be right back to the way you were. It, It doesn't work. You don't really change yourself through your intellect. You have to change yourself at the being level. And through at the intuitive level, you have to change who you are, not how you act. So often we 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 talk about, you know, we think about changes. Okay, what do I need to start doing? What do I need to stop doing? How do I need to be different that's more functional and causes less trouble? You know, what do I have to do? And if we we think about all those things, that's helpful. But if it's all in our intellect, if it's all just us thinking about it. And then doing the things that we think we ought to do because you know we we've come to the conclusion we ought to do them. That's <laughs> all focused on behavior, and the behavior we can change for a few weeks, even a few months. But behavior isn't the key thing. It's not changing how we behave. It's changing how we are. That's mm-hmm. where the change has to take place. Because if we just change behavior, then what we're changing is our image our image of ourselves. We're not really changing ourselves. 
And as much as we like to live in our image, it doesn't work. Who we are just keeps bubbling out all the time. We're not our image of ourselves. We are who we are. And that image is just what we want to lead with, what we want to show other people. But it's not really us. And if it's not us, then it might work fine in the office because those relationships are all mostly superficial. But it doesn't work at all at home. It doesn't work at all in those relationships that are the most important and the most meaningful because there you are who you are. Even if you're trying real hard to be somebody else, it doesn't work for the long term. It's a short term thing. And eventually, as the months go by, it fails. And you you are the same person you all you know you have been, and all of your problems and issues are the same as well. Maybe you've changed them a little bit in context, but it's all still the same stuff. So the idea is you really have to change yourself at the core, at the intuitive level, at the being level. So let's not just make uh, resolutions that have to do with making us act better or making us have a better image to present to people, maybe a softer image or a, a nicer image. Well, that's good. That's civilizing. I mean, there's nothing wrong with us trying to behave better. It just doesn't last because it isn't who we are. It may be civilizing to the, those around us for a while, but it just isn't who we are and who we are always comes back. So even if we say, oh, I'm going to ignore those buttons, when people say those things to me, instead of getting angry, I'm just going to smile. Well, what will happen is you'll just smile and the anger will be inside. Even if you don't express it, even if you can push it down in your subconsciousness enough that you don't even recognize it, it's still there. And it begins to build up resentment because you're sitting here smiling when you feel like being angry and you build up resentment. And you build that resentment up towards yourself and toward other people. So eventually when the dam breaks, <laughs> you go boom and, you know, it all comes out. Now it's even worse than it was before. The blow up always seems to happen eventually. So you make the, you make your, your promises in January and, you know, by February and March, you know, it's starting to unravel. And by spring, it's all pretty much unraveled and you're wondering what happened. Mm -hmm. you know, and then by summertime, you realize everything's just the same as it's always been. You know, and then you go back around to the year and then you make more promises the next January. So <laughs> that, just, that just goes round and round and round and it doesn't really change anything. So don't make so many promises to yourself intellectually. Just be different. Pick a, just pick a simple, a single thing to be different in because being different is not an easy thing to do. I mean, you are how you are, and how do you be different? Well, that's a change that takes a force of will to do that. You have to really want to. Hmm. It's not just an intellectual thing. It's something at a deeper level. You really want to be different. So just pick one thing, one fear, one issue, and work on that as far as being different. Not acting different, but being different. And it may take you the whole year till we get around the next January to make progress on that. But you will make progress on that if you keep working on it. And you will be different. And then that issue will just disappear. It won't just keep coming around and coming around. So that's kind of the approach that I'd suggest that people be aware of the difference between their intellect and their intuition. And if mm -hmm. they work only in the intellectual space, they're liable to end up like puppies chasing their tail. You know, that tail is always right there in front of them, but they can't ever seem to catch it. You know, it's like they almost have their life together, but it falls apart and they can't quite get a hold of it. So just don't try to change everything all at once because that's maybe too much. And what we want is to, to try something smaller and have a success even if it takes you all year, even two years to have that success, have that success, change yourself because the next one will be a lot easier. And the one after that, even easier yet. It's that first 
that first experience that teaches you, I can do this. I can let go of those fears. They don't own me. I can get rid of them. And once you get that, then getting rid of the rest of them isn't nearly as hard as getting rid of that first one. So getting rid of that first one is tough, and it may take some time. And the thing that makes it work is if you really want to do it at a very basic level, because then you'll work on it as long as it takes to succeed. And it won't take that long. You'll succeed probably in six months to a year. You know, it's it's not that long. It's not like it'll take you the rest of your life to work on that one fear. Right. But you have to really be aware of it. Because when you're aware of it, you'll start feeling yourself going into that automatic mode of getting angry or upset. And you just catch yourself there and say, what? No, I don't want to be that way. And you reject it. And you be differently. Not just act differently, but you be differently. And it isn't easy. It's really a struggle. And it's, it's a struggle that takes, you know, a lot of time. It's not something that if you fail three or four or five or 10 or even 20 times, you should give up and say, ah, oh, I can't do it. Right. You do fail a lot. Matter of fact, in the beginning, you fail a whole lot more than you succeed. But you just have to keep working on it. And pretty soon, that failure rate starts to go down and down and down. But, and then you're succeeding more than you're failing. And then you're not failing at all. But it's a, you know. It just takes you tenacity to keep working on that thing, which is why it's better to just pick a thing rather than everything, mm -hmm. because then you'll find success more quickly, and that success will lead to greater success. So that would be my advice for those who kind of get introspective around this time of year, uh, a new year. You know, what's the next year going to be like? Oh, we've got Omicron coming. All right. What if Omicron does like Delta? Or what if it's worse than Delta? Well, we'll have to deal with that when we get there. Let's not turn that into a problem. Let's say that we are going to be challenged this next year and we will grow and become, you know, higher quality consciousness if we meet those challenges in a positive way rather than in an angry, upset, feeling sorry for ourselves or feeling angry at others. You know, if we meet it in that way, then our year is going to be miserable. If we can meet it in a positive way, all right, this is a challenge. It's a hard challenge. It's a challenge that, you know, is not what I'd like to do or not where I'd like to be. Well, we have to deal with that. Life throws us challenges. Sometimes those challenges have pain with them. Sometimes they force us to do and be in situations we don't want. You know, I spent almost two years before I got to see my grandchildren again, you know, when we were going through the first phase. Well, it wasn't quite that bad, but it seemed like an awfully long time. But you just have to say that that's the way it is. These times require us to deal with that in a positive way, not in a negative way. And if you deal with things in a positive way, then the problem doesn't drive you crazy. The problem drives you crazy and, and makes you, you know, kind of challenges your mental health and makes you upset and angry and feeling, I got to get out of here. You know, I'm going stir crazy. All that happens because you're not dealing with it positively. You're dealing with it negatively. If you deal with it positive, then it's, yeah, it's not the way I want it, but it's the way it is. So let's make the best of that. How can I make the best of this situation? even though it's not the situation I would choose. It's the one life has given me. So how do I make the best of it? What do I do in it that's positive and, you know, productive? So then instead of sitting around feeling sorry for yourself because life isn't the way you want it, you start learning and growing in new ways. You get out of the old rut and get into new ways of being and things of doing and ways of growing. So that's the perspective I'd like to pass to people, you know, take that long-term perspective, not a short-term perspective, but long-term perspective of change and make sure that change is at the being level. You're changing the way you respond to things, the way you react changes, not just you're getting better at stuffing it further down and 
you know, ignoring it or denying it or shoving it into the subconscious so you don't have to deal with it. You know, that's not a solution. That's a, just a temporary solution that will end up biting you in the end. It'll make things worse in the long term. So you just be positive about whatever it is happens. You know, so, okay, we have new challenges coming. We live in challenging times, no doubt. Well, the good thing about challenging times is that you get to grow when you're challenged. These challenges are, are opportunities for growth. If we didn't live in challenging times, we wouldn't have nearly as much opportunity to grow and change ourselves. So that's the good thing. So don't let it pass without, you know, taking advantage of these opportunities to grow up. So it's not that I would wish that we always had you know, terrible and hard times. That's not the point. There are good times when you're not being challenged and basically you're just consolidating what you've learned. You know, you're consolidating it and you're, you're kind of firming it all up, get, graining strength in your new ways of being. So we need those times, but then there's challenging times too. And those force us to stretch out and be different and be different in a positive way. And to not let the fact that life isn't the way we want it be a negative thing. Let it be an opportunity to get out of old ruts and get into new ways of being and do that positively. You know, how can I turn this into something useful? What can I do now that my life is different than it used to be? And how can I make that profitable? How can I be helpful to others? You know, what can I do here? So if you do that and have a positive attitude, then you'll find that there's nothing in your environment that will ever upset you or anger you or annoy you because you'll just see those things as challenges to be positive, challenges to accept and deal with in a positive way. But, you know, I, I don't want people to think that it's that you just kind of fly, float above life and aren't a part of it. That's not the case. You need to be involved and connected. You need to be a part of what's going on. But you don't need to be fussing and fuming and, you know, and being angry about it. That's all negative and won't help you grow. Matter of fact, it keeps you from growing. Yeah. So get engaged, get involved. Don't just float above it. You hear the spiritual uh, community sometimes saying you need to be detached. Well, that's not detached from life. That's detached from your ego <laughs> is what you need to be detached from. You need to be detached from your fear from those things that are pushing you inside rather than you making choices, you know, they're making choices because that fear is what's running your choice making. So you need to detach from that, from the ego, from the fear, from the beliefs. So in that way, yes, growing up requires detachment, but that's not detachment from life, detachment from relationship, detachment from, you know, from, from caring and connecting and being a part of things. That's not what you need. You don't need to detach from that. Matter of fact, you need to embrace that. When you embrace life and people and family and work and bosses and all the things you have to deal with, when you embrace them, you see them in a more positive light. And rather than just complaining about them, you'll, you'll learn ways to work better with them. You'll accept that they are just the way they are. And that's okay. You can't help that. You can't change them. So you learn to work with them as they are rather than be angry that they are that way because that way is annoying to you. <laughs> well, that's your problem. Don't be annoyed. They are the way they are. So how can you work positive with them? Well, you may have to change who you are. But that change needs to be for the, you know, for the better. It's a positive change. Don't be so judgmental. Accept things that you cannot control. If you can't control it, being angry with it is futile. Matter of fact, it's worse than futile. It, it, it's a problem. You become part of the problem when you are angry. 
And I know sometimes people say, well, if this doesn't make you angry, then you just don't understand. You know, everybody should be angry about this. Well, no, everybody shouldn't be angry about this. Everybody should care about this and want to want to change this to be something better for everyone. But being angry about it just adds to the problem. Hmm. Doesn't solve the problem. And the idea, well, we could just get enough people angry enough, we could change things. That doesn't work. Hmm. When you get enough people angry enough to change things, the change is usually as bad, if not worse, than what you're changing. It doesn't work out that way. Yeah. That's not, you know, you get rid of one dictator and you end up with another dictator. You know, this doesn't work that way. You have to change things from a positive viewpoint. You have to have, well, if this isn't working, what are some ways that it could work? Find those ways. Ways that you can be positive. And if you can't be positive, then you need to change yourself. You need to be positive. So that's the kind of the, the general hints that I would have to tell people about how do you approach change? How do you approach challenge? How do you approach things being not the way you want them to be? Oh, these people are this way and that upsets me. Why are they like that? Why can't they be the way I want them to be? You see, it's really what you're saying even though what you actually say is, they're so stupid. You know, <laughs> what's the matter with those people? Well, basically, you're, you're saying is, those people disagree with me. Those people aren't the way I want them to be. Well, you need to get over that. Mm. <laughs> Let those people be however they are, because they are also learning from their experience. They also learn from pain. And if the things they're doing are going to cause them pain, well, that's their learning path. You, it's not yours to fix that. Right. You can't go in and change other people. So if they're doing things you think are stupid and, and dysfunctional, well, you can't change them. And hollering at them and shaking your fist at them and calling them names doesn't help change them. It makes it harder for them to change. They double down in their whatever it is their beliefs are. So you just have to let them go through whatever they need to go through so they'll get the consequences of going through it and perhaps learn something. Right. You know, and you have to do that cheerfully. So that's what I mean by accepting. I don't mean that you just poly in, oh, everything is perfect, everything is fine, you know, we're all love inside, so it's all okay. I don't <laughs> mean that at all. It's not Pollyanna when I say you need to accept these things. It means you just have to realize that you are not the master of the universe. You cannot have everything your way. And you need to let people be on their own learning path, even if that learning path takes them through very dysfunctional spaces. They evidently need those dysfunctional spaces to help them learn. And most people learn because they feel pain. That's how they learn. And most people are slow learners, <laughs> very slow learners. So here they are and they're doing, they're making poor judgments and they're causing themselves a lot of pain. And tomorrow they're doing the same thing. And next year they're doing the same thing. Well, slow learners, they're not going to get it quickly, but they will get it eventually. And they will get it more quickly if you don't fuss at them. Because if you fuss at them and tell, call them stupid, then they just are going to be longer yet before they'll, before they'll learn something. You force them into a, what's called cognitive dissonance, which is you don't want to admit you're wrong. You don't want to admit that other people are right. So you'll just double down on, you know, if you were stupid, now you're double stupid and proud of it because you can't really change because you've got this ego commitment mm. to being that way. You see, well, by pushing on people to get them to change basically just charges up that ego. And that's not helping them get there quicker. <laughs> you, you'll help them get there quicker by giving them the safe space in which they can change themselves rather than a, than a, a challenge space or a threatening space that they're going to just push back on. So be kind to those people 
who you think are stupid. Be kind to them. Those people you think are hurting themselves. Be kind to them. Yeah. Give them, give them, not your pity, but your your, your consider your yeah your yeah your, your compassion. Yeah, give them your compassion. Don't pity them. That's kind of putting yourself above them. Exactly. Just give them compassion. They are who they are, and if you can give them some safe space and some encouragement, that will help them learn that lesson more quickly than anything else you can do for them. They need to get to the point where they say, oh, I'm hitting myself, you know, in the head with a hammer. Why am I doing this? I think I should stop. But if you holler at them and say, stop hitting yourself, stop it, that's stupid, you're stupid. Mm. Well, they just have to keep hitting themselves with that hammer because otherwise they'd have to admit they were stupid, you see. So, you know, and of course, everybody, everybody on this side thinks the people on that side are stupid. And all the people on that side think the people on this side are stupid. So I'm talking to everybody. You know? <laughs> I'm talking to everybody on both sides of all the issues because everybody is in that same thing, you know, no matter where you are. The people that you think are stupid and are the problem, they make you angry and you get upset and you feel like you need to fix them. Then you They're are part of the, exactly. your part. Yeah, <laughs> your part. You're, yeah. you're doing the exact same thing and you're part of their problem. They're part of your problem. And you just have this dysfunctional dance that goes on and on and on. And the only way to break that is to change who you are, to step out of that. Stop engaging in that dance of dysfunction and ugliness and negativity, complaining, you know, and, and uh, yeah, you just have to kind of stop being that way because that so, people forget that the other side they believe they're right they wouldn't be doing something that they actually thought was stupid they exactly just, right <laughs> right matter of fact they think you're stupid right. because of what you do right yes yeah so we're talking to everyone here we're not taking a side you know we're we're talking to everyone because that's people do what they do because they think that's the best thing to do but mostly it's their fear and their ego and their beliefs that are bringing them to that conclusion that that's the best thing to do. They're animated and driven by their fear and their beliefs. Okay, well, fussing at them doesn't help them deal with their fear and beliefs. No. Explaining it to them intellectually doesn't help them deal with their fear and beliefs. You can't fix them. You know, now our coworkers and just people in general out in the world, we don't try to fix. But the people in our life we're close to, wow, we try to fix them because we care about them. So we need to set them straight and make them think the same way we do and feel the same way we do. So we try to fix them. But it's the same problem. You have to let them be, too. You have to let them be in their own way and let them find their way. And if there is something they're doing that's stupid, they have to come to that realization before they can change it. And they have to get there on their own. And the idea that you can help them see that by explaining things to them is wrong. Mm. It just doesn't work. It just makes everything worse. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean by you have to just accept that people are on their own path doing the best they can with what they've got. And what they've got is fear up to their eyebrows. What they've got is a ton of beliefs, a lot of ego. That's what they've got. And with all of that, they have to do the best they can with what they've got. Mm -hmm. And as time goes by, they'll evolve and outgrow that ego and those beliefs and that stuff and they'll get better but it won't be quick <laughs> it's going to take a while so you have to just change you so that you can live with them work with them interact with them in a positive way and that's as challenging as any i mean it's you know, learning to accept someone, even though you know, or you believe, or you think, see, this is the problem is that we all have our own triggers that came from our childhood. So, you know, I have this wonderful client who 
goes on and on and on and on and on about his wife. And it's like, well, but she grew up thinking that stability and financial stability is love. It's not her fault. Mm -hmm. That's how her parents, I mean, if she could look at it from a fear perspective, if she could look at it logically, she might be able to see, but whenever there's any type of financial issue, well, she's off the rails, but because that's because she feels one, he's not working hard enough. And two, which is not true. And two is that he obviously doesn't love me. And it's, it's like trying to help someone see that, you know, just support the person. No, don't try to tell her it. <laughs> she's not going to yeah. see that. She's not going to understand that. And right. it's like, I, you, you can hit your head against the wall. It's like, <laughs> No, you get to change because you can accept that because to yeah. her, it's not bad. It's not necessarily even wrong. It's just how she learned our def, our def, her definition of love. Mm -hmm. We all have these really interesting mm -hmm. definitions, right? Sometimes it's a physical thing. Sometimes it's a mental thing. Sometimes it's an emotional thing. We all have learned what love mm -hmm. is because as mm -hmm. children, we had to say, well, Nobody should be abused, but if this person that I love and is supposed to make me feel safe, you know, slaps me every once in a while, well, that's love. And some people will get that and some people won't. But each time a child makes a decision, I mean, they're making a decision because they were a child. Unfortunately, we don't upgrade those decisions. <laughs> we're not aware of those decisions. Yeah. We no, that's, that's because we grow up in our intellect. We become right. more capable at manipulating yeah. our intellect and, you know, our environment. So that intellect kind of outgrows that, but that's not changing who we are. Oh. That we at that intuitive level, at that being level, are still that eight-year-old, you know, that mm -hmm. six-year-old, even that three-year-old. Mm -hmm. We're still there because that is who we are inside and okay our intellect has progressed way past that so now we can act very educated and very uh in charge and everything is under our control and we can do all that from the intellect it's just not true it's not true at all you know until you change yourself you're still that child right you're still that child and that's what that's why we call this this uh process growing up you know it is a growing up process you have to let go of that that child's viewpoint mm -hmm. and it's not an intellectual thing you can't intellectually get there and you can't help somebody get there by intellectually explaining the problem <laughs> that's why people came to the conclusion many years ago that uh, psychiatry really wasn't much of a help you know, if you just had a friend come over and listen to you, that was about as effective as paying a psychiatrist, you know, what, thousands and thousands of, of dollars. And each one worked about the same because a psychiatrist explaining to your intellect what your issue was just isn't all that helpful. You see, so then psychiatry started to change a bit to try to deal with that inner person. And they became you know, more useful when they did that. But psychiatry started out as, well, just explain to people what their issue is. And once they see it, they'll be cured. Well, that didn't work. You know, that was not, it's just not the way it, it works. So now they understand they have to dig deeper and, and uh, you know, work at a different level if they're going to not only be a psychiatrist, just be a counselor and just be helpful, just be a good friend. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can't do it at the intellectual level. You have to connect with people at the being level, if you're really going to connect with them. Now, if you're just going to superficially connect with them, well, you can do that at the intellectual level. That's what most of us do with the people we work with. Right. Well, we go to work with them and, you know, we're there eight hours a day, you know, turning our crank, doing what we do, and we interact with everybody intellectually. And that works just fine because in the workplace, there's rules that say, don't talk about things that are controversial. Don't talk about religion. Don't talk about politics. Don't talk, you know, mm. we have those rules and everybody pretty much obeys them. 
and it works. So all the relationships are superficial and they're all intellectual for the most part. <laughs> and that's okay because that's all you're trying to do is grease the, the social skids enough to get your work done. But when you come home, it doesn't work like that. But people try to do the same thing at home that they do at work. You know, they, they try to make the relationship superficial. They try to manipulate to get it the way they want it, which is what they do at work. And all of that's counterproductive in a relationship that is much more meaningful than superficial. All that stuff just doesn't work. You have to let that go and actually deal with things at a, at a more fundamental level, not the superficial level. Superficially treating, you know, your significant other is just going to create resentment and it's going to create explosions. Mm -hmm. Everybody will suck it up to the point that they can't anymore. And then boom, you know, mm -hmm. anger, hollering, screaming, crying, you know, you have big problems. And then you suck it up for a while and then boom, you know, people go through these things that, oh, they have a nice month maybe between explosions or a nice three weeks or a nice week or whatever, but they're not really changing. They're trying to deal with deep problems by superficial means, and that won't work. Right. You've got to change who you are. You cannot change who somebody else is. Right. And explaining to them how they need to change is, dis is, is worse than <laughs> just keeping your mouth shut. You know, saying nothing at all is a lot better than trying to fix somebody else. So that's typically uh, the way it is with most people. Now, some people are right on the edge of getting it, and a little nudge then, even maybe from the intellect, might help. But that's rare. That's the very rare circumstance. That has to be that person is just just a tiny bit from getting it themselves and a little nudge maybe will help pop them over. So those cases do exist and people can say, oh yeah, well, I talked to somebody and it really helped them, you know, it was all intellectual. That's because they were ready to help themselves and you maybe gave them that last nudge, but if you had never said anything, they'd have gotten there just the same, maybe a week later because they were right on the verge of getting it. So yeah, that happens, but when it does, it's a rare event. Don't depend on that. Don't think that that's the rule. If you explain it to somebody, they'll think about it and agree with you because, you know, you have, you're right. And, you know, you understand everything, right? That's the way people feel about themselves. Um, yeah. <laughs> you, know, you, just, you just don't have any idea how different we all are. All of us live in our own reality. We're yeah. all very different. We don't live in the same reality. And when I'm in my reality and I say, well, I know how everything works in my reality. So if I just explain it to you, you know, then that'll be fine. You can, you can feel good like I do. Well, mm -hmm. that's not your reality. Me explaining to you, you know, how you should be to be good in my reality doesn't help you in your reality because you don't see things that way. That's not what's important to you. Your reality is different. Different things are important. Yeah, you know, to you, like you say, maybe you're the person that uh, needs financial um, security in order to feel loved, or maybe you need presence in order to feel loved. Somebody needs to buy you things, or when you're feeling really depressed, you want to go out and buy things for yourself because you know getting things is what makes you feel okay. Or you feel okay. Food. So we think yeah. love food and, you know, something sweet and something, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. we have so many things that we just don't realize is part of our ingrained. Yeah. And all of it makes us worse. You know, yes, you, you know, you eat cheesecake because that makes you feel better. You know, it's your comfort food. Well, right. now you're discomforted because you're 10 pounds overweight. You know, and then 20 pounds overweight, and that makes you feel worse. Yeah. So what you think is supposed to make you feel better ends up long-term making you feel worse. And it just works that way because you're not solving the problem, really. You're stuffing the problem down out of sight. 
is what you're doing. Uh, just concentrate on how nice and tasty that is and forget about all the stuff that's annoying and unpleasant. Right. I feel better already, you see. For about that's, <laughs> Yeah, right. For, for, for the well, next minute. Cheesecake. <laughs> right. Then you... Then you don't feel so better, you know, and the next day you feel even worse yet because now you're a couple of pounds heavier. Yeah. So exactly. Those are not really solutions. And every time you try to push a solution that's not a solution, it makes things worse in the long term. So, oh, yeah, it's OK. This is, you know, this is my comfort food. Well, <laughs> not a good idea. <laughs> not a good idea. You need to find comfort at a fundamental level, you know, at the being level, you need to find peace and happiness that's real, not that is imagined because it tastes good or imagined because you just bought yourself something expensive. So now you feel good about yourself or somebody else gets you something expensive. If you loved me, you'd bring me roses, right? Mm -hmm. If you loved me, you'd buy me jewelry or you'd do this or you'd do that. You'd, 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 uh, You'd pretend that my reality was like yours and you would do whatever I want. You know, if you love me, you would do whatever I want. If you love me, you'd be my slave, right? You would uh, be my, my butler or my, my servant. If you love me, you would do what I want you to do. Well, all of that's nonsense. It has nothing to do with love. Love isn't about getting what you want. Love is something you give away for free. Not because somebody else gave you something, so now you can give them something, but you just give it away because it's there and it's yours to give. And you got plenty of it. You can spread that love, you know, far and wide. It's not like you've only got so much that so you have to be careful who you give it to. <laughs> love is something that has no end and you can, you can give away lots of it. It just has to be real. From the being level, from the, it's, it has to be an intuitive thing, not an intellectual thing. So let's, if we have to make any any plans or make any uh, uh, things, make any what statements, what do we call them, uh, resolutions. We have to make any resolutions going into the new year. Let's make a resolution to be real. Mm -hmm. You know, make a resolution to find authenticity and be who we are. And if we don't like who we are, well, then let's resolve to change that, not cover it up with a with a uh, image, but change who we are if you don't like it. And if you do like it, then hang on to that, do it. And if other people don't like it, but you do, well, find other friends, <laughs> yeah, go someplace else, be authentic. So that would be, you know, be real. Yeah. Understand that, that what you're doing, that you get upset, understand that's you, your fear, right. your needs, your ego, your beliefs. And the only thing that will change them is you. And to think that I'd be just fine if everybody else would be the way I want them to be, that's <laughs> never going to happen. So just let that idea go. It isn't going to work that way. No. <laughs> Those other people live in their own reality and they have their own fear, their own egos and their own beliefs, which which make their own reality. And it's not your reality. Right. So you need to learn to be positive with whatever it is that other person has and deal with it positively. And with a little luck, maybe they'll learn to deal with your reality positively. But if they don't, well, that's OK. They're on their path. They'll learn someday, and there's no way to help them learn other than to stay positive and give them a safe place in which they can stretch out and change themselves. So that should be kind of the attitude moving into the, into the new year. Be authentic, be real, work not from the intellect, but from what's inside you at your core. That's what I mean by being authentic is finding out what is in your core. You know, that's the first step is, is kind of getting in touch with who you are. All that fear, all that um, ego, all those beliefs. Well, get realize that is you. You do have that fear. You do have that ego. These things upset you. Why do they upset you? Well, it's not the way it should be. Well, 
learn to deal with that positively, not negatively by getting upset or negatively by complaining. Learn to deal with it positively. And people think, well, that's impossible. You know, these people are really awful. How can I deal with them positively? <laughs> well, you can. Not only you can, but you must. If you're going to be happy, if you're going to find peace, if you're going to, to enjoy and grow and become more in your life, then you need to learn how to deal with them positively. That's what you're here for. That's what you're supposed to be doing is growing up, learning how to do it. So rather than just say, oh, I can't, that's too hard. I'm me and I've got all these wants and needs and people need to just give me what I want and be the way I want them. You will live a life of frustration and anxiety and anger and negativity. And then you'll begin to feel sorry for yourself. Oh, woe is me. The world treats me so unfairly. I'm such a victim. Yeah, and such a victim. And that means the rest of your life until you outgrow that is going to be miserable. And the next life, too, and the one after that, you know, until you get out of that, you just have to say, well, here I am. All right, now, what can I do that's positive? How can I grow from here? All right, I got all this ego, buttons, people push, and I get angry. That's me. Now, do I, do I want to stay that way? generally the the answer would be no i'd like i'd like to be happier you know i'd like not to get angry and upset well then change yourself don't think you're going to get happy because you're going to change other people change yourself then no matter how ugly that world is outside you'll be happy in it you can stay positive and when people tell you well if you're not angry you just don't understand <laughs> you will realize that they don't understand and they're part of the problem. And you do understand and you're part of the solution. Even if you don't do anything, but just be who you are. You're a, you're a shining light in a sea of negativity. And just by being positive, you will help a whole lot of people. Show them the possibilities. Yeah. I think one of the big things is what our definition of happiness is. A lot of times we think it's something external. We forget that we have the choice. May not always feel like a choice, but that's the whole bit about the positivity. Mm -hmm. the we feel happy within. It's not, it's not something that we get from somebody. It's not something that we buy each other. It's, it's, it has to come from within. It has to be mm -hmm. more intuitive versus intellectual because I think we focus a lot on the intellectual. Like, oh, well, I'll be happy when. <laughs> Right. Exactly. Yeah. And that doesn't work because even if when comes, there'll be another win right after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even if you do get, even if they do act the way you want them to act, something else will come up immediately to replace that. And you'll still be back in the same place that you were. Yeah. It never, uh, you know, people see their life as a series of hurdles, you know, that they've gotten over and oh, if I could just get past this, everything would be great. And sometimes they get past it and everything isn't great. It's great for a month, but it's just not great in the long term because they haven't changed. Right. Sometimes life passes you, you know, the, the easy stuff. Sometimes life is throwing you softballs rather than hardballs. And everything seems great. But if you don't learn through that time, if you just say, ah, oh, feels good, let the good times roll and everything's good and you don't make an effort, then that life won't always throw you the softball. <laughs> like sometimes <laughs> it's going to throw you the hardball and the curveball and all sorts of things for you to deal with. And then you're just like, well, I'm under siege. I can't grow now because everything is whatever. And oh, everything's easy now. And I can't grow now because everything's just fine. Why should I change it? You say, well, you never grow. <laughs> you have to have this focus on changing yourself and you have to take whatever you get hardball softball curveball or you know something just sweet and lovely you have to be aware that you need to make better choices you've got fear you've got ego you've got beliefs and you need to get rid of that stuff because that's what makes you unhappy right that's the stuff that makes you unhappy it's not other people that make you unhappy it's your fear your ego and that fear and ego is what you know, we define 
love, many of us define love, as you, as you say, in terms of what makes you feel better. Oh, I feel better when I'm financially secure. I feel better when I get presents. I feel better when people do what I want. Hmm. Well, no. not just presents. It has to be presents that you actually want. <laughs> oh, and you may not even have to actually want them, but they have to be very expensive. Because if they're expensive, they mean you love, they love you. Right. Obviously, they love you because, you know, they, they spent a lot of hard-earned resources on you, and that means they love you. You see, well, it doesn't mean anything of the sort. It mm. means that they have learned how to manipulate you. That's all. You know? And have so, lost bills at the end of Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So none of that, yeah, none of that really works. You you have people who, when they were small, and, you know, almost everybody's walking around today feeling insecure, mm-hmm. feeling inadequate, feeling not like they don't have enough value. They're, they're not really what they should be. And that is so endemic mm. that it's, you know, it, you have to look at it. Where did all that come from? Well, a lot of it comes from in the last, what, 100 years, we shifted from extended family to nuclear family. In a nuclear family, well, and then the nuclear family shifted from one wage earner to two wage earners. Mm -hmm. So it takes two wage earners, two two wages to actually keep a family prosperous enough to have the things that they find that they think are necessities. Well, that means that mom and dad both go off to work. Kids have to go someplace else. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they're kept by caregivers. Mom and dad come home and they've just worked a hard day and they really don't feel so much like playing you know they feel like unwinding and they've got to cook dinner then they got to clean up they got to you know do whatever they have to do to get ready for the next day so what happens is the children are then you know how do the children interact with adults well that's how the children get a sense of love get a sense of being cared for and basically the adults see their children in basically only two ways one if they're quiet, which means they can let me cook dinner, they can let me do the things I need to do. Uh, if they're quiet, then you ignore them. Mm-hmm. When they're not quiet, when they're fighting and you know creating trouble, then you fuss at them. So that's what you get when you have a nuclear family with both people working. A great deal of the adult-child interaction is the good times are when you're being ignored. The bad times are when you're being fussed at. You see, well, you grow up feeling inadequate. You grow up feeling unvalued. You grow up as always being shunted aside because, yeah, mom and dad have to go to work. They have to do this. They have to change the oil in the car. They have things to do. They have to cook dinner. They have all these things they have to do. And they just don't have time from you because you're just not that important. Mm -hmm. The oil in the car is important. Getting dinner fixed is important. Going to work is important, but you're just not that important. So children grow up feeling insecure, that they're not all that important. Well, what happens? They're Now they're 40 years old or 50 years old or something, and they feel like they just don't have that much value. They feel inadequate because that's what they felt from babyhood to 18 when they got out of the house. And they go out, of course, get married, have a two, you know, have a nuclear family, and they do the same thing with their kids, mm-hmm. you know, because, because that's it. And they love their kids, right. but some, you know, they have to get have a job, they have to fix dinner, they have to change the oil. You know, there's things in life that they have to do, and if the children would just play nicely together. Well, that's good. Then they could go do those things, and everybody's happy. And if the children fight, well, then you got to go fuss at them and tell them to cut it out. They're being bad children. And we don't realize that the sense of feeling inadequate is is cultural. It's part of our culture. And that builds, that creates fear of being inadequate, not being good enough. That creates ego and and all sorts of ego um, ways of dealing with that fear. So some people deal with that fear of being inadequate by being bullies. 
by being forceful, by being demanding, demanding that things be the way they want. That makes them feel better because people do what they want. Well, they feel better about that. Like these people like me because they're doing what I want. No, <laughs> they're doing what you want because you're creating a big fuss if, <laughs> if they don't, you know? And yeah. so we have then all this dysfunctional behavior that's there trying to deal with that fear. Other people deal with that fear of being adequate by being shrinking violets. Mm -hmm. Oh, tell me what to do. No, I don't have an opinion. Yeah, I'll go wherever you want to go. And they, they kind of shrink down to the point that they don't want to stand up and offer and do things because they're inadequate. You know, what could they do? So they become the shrinking violets rather than the bully or the or the person that's demanding or the person that is is in charge all the time. You have to do it my way or the highway. So there's a thousand different ways that people deal with their fear. Yeah. That's what the ego does. The ego is there to whitewash the fear, to deal with the fear. So now you have people who have this sense of being inadequate. They have their strategies for dealing with that fear. And all of those strategies for dealing with the fear actually just make their fears come true. Because yeah. you're bossy or pushy or whatever, because you have fear of being inadequate, well, people don't like you as much. Uh-oh. What you, what, how you act actually creates the fear, the thing you fear. Yes, people don't like you so much. And because you never have an opinion or you, you don't really give much to anything, you're always just there on the sidelines, well, people kind of overlook you. And they don't like you as much because you don't have much to contribute. Well, you see, your reactions to the fear or because you have the fear makes you act in ways that create that fear actually coming true. Right. You make that fear come true. Now you can look at the facts of life and say, yeah, I am inadequate. Look, <laughs> look at my life. It's a mess, you see. And then your, your ego says, well, that's not your fault. It's all their fault. And then you, you know, you blame things on other people because that is another escape from your fear. If you saw your fear, you'd have to blame it on you. And then that would be terrible. Now you'd be <laughs> depressed. So that's kind of the catch 22 that people get themselves into. That's why it's so hard to get out of it. Mm -hmm. You see, we keep doing things that validate our fears. We act in ways that validate our fears. And so the, the fear just tends to grow and we tend to, become more and more fearful. We get better and better at our strategies for ignoring and denying that fear. So we blame other people more and more. We become more angry in general with life because life sucks and life is not friendly and life is just too hard and, and so on. And you see where that spiral goes. It just goes down and down and down and down until it crashes and depression at the end of it, and then you're depressed. Yeah. And then you feel sorry for yourself. And now you're at the bottom. Now, sometimes people hit that dark night of the soul when they hit bottom and they respond, they come back and they change. That's good if they can just keep on that path because now they're trying to change themselves. And sometimes they just stay down there and wallow around in that self-pity all the rest of their life but they learned how to make strategies so that they can have a few friends, you know, people they can complain to, <laughs> you know, so they, they keep, so they're nice to some people. So they have people to complain to. So in any case, that's kind of the way our world works. Our cultural is very dysfunctional in the way we interact, the way we treat our children, the way we, you know, the way our, our, our businesses try to take advantage of their people. You know, it's not like, how can we help these people grow? How can we help these people become, you know, uh, better employees? How can we grow our people? It's not like that. How can we get more out of our people and give them less? You know, what kind of tricky things can we do? You know, how can we change their benefits around, which actually makes it better for us and less good for them, but we'll dress it up and tell them that it's a, it's a great thing for them. You know, so corporations tend to want to, take advantage of their people 
use their people? How can we trick these professionals into working for free? Oh, you're salaried. You just work to the job. And then we'll give them more work than anybody could possibly do in eight hours and expect them to work for free. Well, that usually works. You see, it's, it's this attitude of using other people to get what we want. And people who are feel inadequate kind of fall right into that trap. And now you have this big dysfunctional culture that just grinds on with a lot of unhappy people complaining and calling each other's names and you're stupid, no, you're stupid. And here we are, <laughs> right? This is where we live. Here we are. Okay, folks, we got a new year coming up. Let's not join that that merry-go-round. Let's get off that merry-go-round and say, I don't want to play that game anymore. It's dysfunctional. I don't want to be that way anymore. I'm going to be real. I'm going to be caring. I'm going to care about people. I'm going to let people be whoever they are, and I'm going to deal with them positively. I'm going to find fun. I'm going to find positivity. I'm going to find, you know, a happy space a peaceful space to live in. And I'm going to be as nice and as giving as I can to people and let them be. And now you've sown the seeds of success. And that will just get easier and easier and more and more rewarding as you go and more and more natural. But you got to start the process someplace. And mainly we start it by looking at where we are. That's what history is good for. History is good to look and say, here's where we are. And here's why we're here. Now, let's change at the root, not out at the branches and the leaves. You know, let's not get just prettier leaves on the tree. Let's change at the root, change who we are so we don't do this year after year after year. And it may take us a few years to even take the first step. But so what? we got the rest of our life. And that first step will start to grow, and that path will start to broaden and it'll just get better and better. And then you'll find out that people don't have to be the way you want them to be. They can be just who they are, and that's okay. That's not a problem. They'll learn someday, some lifetime. Yeah, they'll learn. And as it is, just be considerate and kind and have some compassion for them. And your joy will come from being helpful rather than winning. Now, you know, a lot of people's Pleasure and joy comes from winning. You know, I beat those. Then, or I got them, I forced them to be the way I wanted them to be. I win. But in the long run, in the long run, you're going to lose. Your life is going to be all struggle. And that winning is going to turn, it looks bright and shiny, but it's going to get tarnished real, real soon. So if you really want to win, let the other people be. Change yourself and find that happiness inside you. Don't make it the environment's job to provide you with happiness. That won't work. The environment isn't made to make you happy. You have to make yourself happy by being positive. So go. That's yeah. So <laughs> go, people. Get out there and uh, you know grab yourself by the bootstraps and pull yourselves up out of the muck. Rise kind of up above what your culture, you know, feeds you. Yes. This this culture is just the uh, basically abusive from one end to the other. You know, it's not a culture that feel that feeds positivity. So you have to be the change. You have to be the change, right? Yeah. In the world. All you right. don't make the change, you be the change. Right. Well, I think you've given us lots to think about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Lots to think about for this new year coming and how we might be different so that we can end up in a happy space, in a positive space, rather than one that's just struggling or just getting by or is negative or one that's depressed or one that's, that, uh, that's kind of blaming others. You know, it really is a nice place to be. It's a great, it's a great environment in which to grow up. You just have to get past enough of that fear to where you feel the positiveness of it and then it just tends to grow. So that's what I say. Taking that first step is the hard one. Right. Taking that first step is the hard one because you have to change. And when you change, 
you're going to be out of step with your culture. You're going to be out of step with your friends and with your family. And they're going to think you're a bit weird and a little strange because you're not going to, to be that person you were before. But you're going to be a lot happier. And they're going to enjoy you a whole lot more. And they're going to like being around you a whole lot more because you're positive. And you just don't complain. You actually do things for them. You're helpful. So you'll see. It all just grows and gets better and better. You just have to start someplace. And that someplace that you have to start is not your intellect. The place you have to start is at a deeper level. It's, a, it's your being level where you start. Well, over and out, Laurie. That's, uh, that's all. I, that's, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Yeah, that's all I got to say. All right. All well, right. A, a lecture from your old Dutch Uncle Tom. <laughs> yeah. Again, you've given us lots to think about. I, I wish everyone a happy new year. I know you do as well. Indeed. Happy new year. Happy holidays. And may your year just get better and better no matter what happens. There you go. You've been listening to News of the Heart. We've been getting to the heart of what matters with Tom Campbell and looking at just a new perspective for a new year. Thanks, Tom.